Hello everyone, this is Jaslyn here and thank you for tuning in to the Growth Marketing Webinar with GMA Content Series featuring top marketers to help you and your brand to succeed. Welcome to our fifth webinar series and the topic for today is a little bit different than before as we were focusing on a technical aspect such as affiliate and content marketing. Recently, there's an increased interest in the road to Southeast Asia and we are so honored to have April Lam with us today. She's the founder and managing partner of ALO Consulting, who has led more than 100 projects in APEC. Today, she'll be sharing with us the top five keys to enter Indonesia market and how to expand business internationally during the COVID-19 pandemic. The agenda for today will be a 40-minute sharing by April, followed by a 10 to 20 minutes of Q&A session where you get to ask April anything and everything in regards to the topic. Please feel free to utilize the chat tab on the right hand side and vote for the questions that you want April to answer and the question with the highest vote will be answered as a priority. Um, if you can see on the chat tab there was there's a link there if you ever encounter any technical difficulties please feel free to click that link. Anyway so let us begin and I will hand over this session to April who is in Hong Kong right now. Hi April. Hi, thanks so much GMA for inviting me to this webinar and thanks everyone for attending this um, in the evening after your work time. Thanks so much. And I know today we've got audience from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Malaysia, and maybe some other cities. So I'm, I'm really excited to share my experience with you. So um, before we start, just a little bit about what I do, who am I? I am the founder of ILO Consulting. Jesslyn kindly introduced me. And before I started this consulting business to help companies to enter Southeast Asian market, I was actually um, uh, involved in a few branding consultancy and I was the head of marketing of some retail companies. So during my course of about 17 years of work experience, I've traveled around Southeast Asia ever since 2007. So I realize all this time I've seen the evolution and improvement of this region and I see so much potential there. So I started this business hoping to help more exciting brands to enter this market. So without further ado, let's learn more about ASEAN and particularly Indonesia today. And later I'll explain why Indonesia. All right, very key things. We need to know what we are going to listen to today and what will be the takeaways. So first of all, why ASEAN and why now? What happened during the pandemics? What are the opportunities arise during this period of time? And then the five common mistakes that I've seen from the clients I've worked with, from the big and small brands that I've worked with, the common mistakes that they have made, something that we could have avoided, and the five keys to make your growth easier. And then all we would love to know what are the free resources out there? How could we maximize the uh, existing resources in the market, be it like information portal or organizations that we could speak to or some key research um, um, materials? And then lastly, which is the most exciting part, is the real case study from my client, a Hong Kong based fashion watch brand, how they did a market entry to Indonesia and that was just made within four to five months time. All right, so during the pandemic, the whole world's economy dropped as a matter of fact, but then at the same time, a lot of organizations started looking at which is the next um, markets for development and then ASEAN actually top one of all these markets among the emerging countries and here if you look at these figures you could see the the growth projection and the GDP growth during this time for ASEAN actually didn't drop that bad and the projection for next year it, there you see a six percent of growth which is a really really good number and among all these ASEAN countries yeah, um, and among all these um, ASEAN countries, Indonesia's drop is the smallest. And I'm going to explain why is that so. So the biggest potential of ASEAN market, firstly, of course, people look at it like a, a huge population. And second, the median, um, median age 
of this population is between 28 to 32. To give a bit more context to that, Hong Kong's median age is 12 years more than that number. So this young population actually facilitated the development of a lot of e-commerce, social commerce, and a lot of um, F FMCG consumption. Also, the government of some of these countries, particularly here, you see some cases on Vietnam and Indonesia. They've done so much to invite and attract foreign direct investment. And during this year, this year so far, Vietnam has got more than 100 MNC confirmed that they would shift their China production or US production to Vietnam. So this would facilitate and lead to a lot of job opportunities and, and uh, startup opportunities. And for Indonesia, for example, the government has confirmed to spend 400 billion on infrastructure until 2024, and uh, with 35% of investment coming from private sector. And these infrastructure covers from harbor to special economic zone, to, to uh, railway, highway, electric bus, and so on. And um, for Hong Kong, which is more relevant to us, is that the there are bilateral agreements signed between Hong Kong and all these ASEAN countries, 10 of them. Most of these agreements were just activated at the beginning of this year, which would benefit very specific industries in Hong Kong, including fashion, toys, and food that all originated from Hong Kong. I think it's a very good and exciting news for those of you who are in these industries. So we now we know the macro picture of ASEAN. Let's look at what has happened during this COVID time, and particularly the e-commerce scene, because whenever people think about ASEAN, the first thing they would know is, oh, the e-commerce is booming. So let's compare before and after a pandemic. Before the pandemic, the ASEAN e-commerce sector had already grown by 600% within just four years and is estimated to grow further by 2025. During the pandemic, the ASEAN economy grew further. Simply, I think it's very similar in many markets in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Malaysia, people stay home, they got stuck, they have to shop online. To give you a bit more information on this, the biggest growth happened in Indonesia and Vietnam, where the growth of e-commerce is 40% big, big number, and followed by Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, and Singapore, where they grew 20%. Lazada, everyone know this brand, and um, their sales in Indonesia increased by 120% only in Q1 this year. And the number of orders placed increased by 185 million. That's a huge number. It's like the total e-commerce number of transactions combined, Hong Kong and Singapore. The growth benefits both local and international brands. We know Lazada, Solora, but there are a lot of small players in the whole ASEAN region, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, Malaysia. Everyone has their own local players. So, for example, in Vietnam, there's an e-commerce Cosando. The number of their web traffic grown during the pandemics is actually the same as Shopee because all these small players, smaller players, they're really strong, particularly in tier two and tier three cities. So the potential isn't just on a certain number of companies, but the, the whole industry has got the benefit. And of course, during this time, there is a, a lot faster adoption of digital payment options. And then I'm going to give you a few more cases in this regard. Majority of consumers in ASEAN, they still use cash. And that actually um, gives a lot of opportunities to start out. I'll show you a lot more cases, but here let's give you, a, a, let's drop a name, is Ship It from Australia. They realize a lot of people still use cash. So what's gonna happen when they use the, the, the uh, e-commerce? They need better cash on delivery services. So this Australian company build that logistics and payment service around this. So I think these are really good opportunities for those of you who are in startup and tech. Okay, there are 10 markets in ASEAN and unless 
you're from uh, MNC, and uh, I always I always advise my clients who are in in smaller or medium companies, you have to start with one market and really focus your resources on that because it takes a lot of efforts to build a local network and build your team. So the first question is, which is the best market to start with, which is the first market that makes the most commercial sense, the, the, the logical sense, and would give the biggest return to your business? Usually, we would say Indonesia. This is not an absolute case, though. I, I need to um, make that claim. For some industry, they might prefer Vietnam or, or Malaysia or Cambodia. But let's look at Indonesia today. It will become the fourth biggest economy by 2030, um, based on the world's figure. And even before that happened, currently at this moment, the number of middle class in Indonesia is about 50 million people, which is like Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia's population combined. You might have seen different numbers and myself have seen a lot of different numbers and sometimes I see 100 million as well. So in Indonesia, for even for the middle class, there are different segments of middle class. There's the emerging middle class, the established middle class, and the affluent middle class. So when we do marketing, when we do the, uh, the market growth acquisition, we need to be very specific which segment of middle class we're targeting. Each of them has different behaviors, uh, shopping preference. They have different um, and, and payment options and some of them have credit cards, some of them don't. And I'm going to tell you more later. So overall, these type of 50 million, this group of people, they are very quick in adoption of digitalization, um, be it from the consumer perspectives, maybe they're very active on social media, shopping, on marketplace, they have, they have e-wallets, or they are very used to using Gojek, and etc. So all these facilitate the growth of the younger economy. And of course, Indonesia's current president, Jokowi, is very known for his vision and, um, and ambitious uh, 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 and the execution ability for the country. He has implemented a lot of reforms to invite foreign direct investment and improve the education and etc which makes Indonesia highly competitive around the whole region. Um, from the Hong Kong side, there are a lot of organizations promoting the bilateral trades with Indonesia as well. So including Trade Development Council, a lot of business chambers, the Productivity Council, like myself, I have basically attended at least four webinars per month um, during the pandemic times, organized by Hong Kong organizations regarding business development to Indonesia. So this, this country is getting a lot more attention than before. And a lot of businesses are looking for guidance to how to do their market entry or growth acquisition, local marketing more effectively. So because I think a lot of you are very interested in e-commerce, I'll give you a bit more details. In terms of the e-commerce development for Indonesia, it is already number three in the world. And the size of the uh, e-commerce economy will surpass India's. So that's a huge, huge number. And in terms of the spending, it's 2.5 times higher than India. Um, and during the pandemic times, you can't believe it, there are 10 million more users on e-commerce. So just by this growth, it's already such a huge number. And a lot of times people would ask, so what are the most popular categories? What kind of products people like? So here are the keys, health and personal care, groceries, home improvements, and work from work from home tools, and ginger, which I find it uh, uh, is, a, is a fun fact to share. Why ginger? Because most Asians believe that ginger can fight against flu and keep you healthy. And Indonesia as a country that grows a lot of ginger, I think it's number one uh, ginger manufacturing country in Southeast Asia, people buy a lot of domestic ginger. So tons of them were sold during this time. And um, the average daily transactions on e-commerce doubled during the pandemic time. 
So we know the ASEAN picture. We know the Indonesia picture. Now let's go to a more micro level. What exactly drive the consumer demands in the market? And let's start with understanding the structure of the economy of Indonesia. There are 60 million micro SMEs in Indonesia. That's a huge, huge number, of course. 66% of them are unbanked. They don't have bank account. Of course, not a business account, sometimes not even a personal bank account, which is very common there. They don't use credit card and only 16% of them have adopted digital services. A lot of them are not even on Google Maps, so you can't find them. They are known, they get their business by reputation, by being there for decades. However, it doesn't mean they are not popular. The sales volume, the consumer behaviors and the activities are there. For example, 72% of FMCG transactions are actually generated in these small stores, and we call it waru, which means really small shops, small restaurants, mom and pop, and which actually create opportunities for tech firms e-commerce marketplace and banks, they try to step into this area of services. And this is how they do it. Um, there is a bank called Mitra Bank in Indonesia and Bukalapak, which is the number number two or number three largest e-commerce players in Indonesia. They collaborate a program to facilitate these problems digital procurement. What they do is that they give them certain branding, some POSM to, to brighten up their little stores help them to get on Google Maps so they could be searched and give them a tool and app so that they they can do their procurement at lower cost and help them to install all these devices, QR code, digital payment, so that it attract the younger customers who live nearby to shop there. The key of this is that we see a merge of the online activities, like you search things online, you compare prices, you pay with your e-wallet, now all these behaviors could happen on the offline level among these mom and pop stores and it smoothens the whole process and um, it helps the younger generation to adapt it because the behavior that they always do offline in this world room will reinforce and integrate with what they do online. I think it's a very powerful O2O integration going on in Indonesia right now. And of course, among these mom and pop shops, cost is still the competitive edge. And there are more, more. Um, there's more than just one scam here. I just cite the uh, Mitra Bank and Bukalapa, but there are a few more. And feel free to look it up on internet if you're interested in this area. So to summarize what happened to ASEAN and Indonesia during this time, there are a lot of resources spent on supporting the uh, micro SMEs and a lot of inclusive business models connecting the lower income communities that also have the consumer uh, con cons uh, consumption power. Government and private enterprises would work together and it helps the women, especially in the rural areas, that they have more resources to start their small businesses with all these powerful tools. So it encouraged a certain level of women economic empowerment as well. There's also a stronger force for tech, fintech, tech, cybersecurity, and all these periphery services of e-commerce get more creative and competitive. So um, what people always want to know is that they, they want to avoid and uh, all the mistakes and have a very smooth market entry. So here are the five top keys that I would like to share with you. A lot of times people do read a lot of reports and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you do that as well. We read all these McKinsey report, um, Euro Monitor, Statista and etc. And we got so overloaded with information. So the number one question would be, if my business want to enter Indonesia, where should I start looking for information without distracting myself with too much data? And here are a few that I would highly recommend, and I always go to these resources to, to look up information for my clients as well. Um, so the Investment Coordination Board of Indonesia's website has a lot of uh, information on the tax, regulations, latest policy, you have to look through it. 
And then there's a, a, a website called ASEAN Briefing. It covers not just Indonesia, but also Malaysia, Cambodia, and etc. And then KR Asia is the private uh, research firm. I find them uh, their their analysis are very up to date, and they have a lot of um, startup data there. And of course, there's uh, this Indonesian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. They are very helpful, and they would connect you with the local resources that you need. And uh, there's a TDC office, Trade Development Council office in Jakarta, and there's a, a full team there that would help Hong Kong enterprises to look for local resources. So keep this page, it's super important for you. The other question a lot of brands would say is that they find it hard to localize their brand image, their activities. And sometimes it's not just about pricing adjustment, which is actually the easiest uh, part, because the rule of thumb is that any products from other countries need to increase their price by at least 25% when they enter Indonesia because of the high tax. And later I'll show you a page of what kind of tax are involved. This is actually the easiest. The more difficult is how they should adjust their brand image and marketing activities. And here I want to give you an example of Jakarta Notebook. Um, not sure if any one of you have heard about this. If you judge by the name, you were saying, okay, this business is based in Jakarta. It's only in Jakarta and they sell notebook only, which is, no, it's totally not the case. JakartaNotebook.com is one of the biggest platform for selling consumer electronics, which means they also sell electric scooter. As you can see from this, this is a, a screen capture from their website. They sell, um, coffee machine and they sell earphone and etc so what happened is even though this business is very strong online they're actually stronger offline their offline store looks nothing fancy not in prime location and it basically looks like one of those convenience stores that you would commonly see in indonesia so when the big brands enter, they would think like, oh, it's not so on brand. It's not quite consistent with what we do in Hong Kong or China. And the banner is not well designed. And my brand is going to sit next to some local brand that I don't know. But that's OK. That's exactly the local context of Indonesia is that everything is very basic. But the sales volume is there. The consumers go there. Consumers would accept that. And um, when a brand first enter a country, I think we might need to accept certain level of um, adapting our brand image in order to fit in this environment and not to look too intimidating to the majority of the consumers. And once you test the market, you see the sales, you know the segment, then it's time for you to build your standalone store. Then you could full scale to roll out your real brand positioning. And this type of O2O integration is the biggest mission for marketers. On the website, you might look very fancy. In offline, you look basic. Again, it's super okay for Indonesia. So why do we need to put strong focus on, on the offline retail? Um, let me give you an example here for consumer electronics. 70% of the purchases still take place offline. And this is a figure of um, 2020. Even though the proportion, the percentage would drop to 64% a few years later, the offline purchase is still the majority of consumption. When you plan to enter Indonesia, don't miss out this opportunity offline. And um, and clients also like to ask, so uh, what is the difference between the consumers who shop online and offline? They're actually pretty much the same. If you look at the figures here, um, the, the split between lower income, mid income and high income group are pretty much the same. There, you don't see such a big difference as in other mature markets. So if you want to cover all these targets, test out who your real customers are, you have to go with online and offline together. Number three, surprise cost. Well, it's like the Murphy's Law. There's always surprise cost when you enter Indonesia. Um, not sure if you've heard about this middle person culture, and it happens in, in quite a lot of um, emerging markets, actually. 
anything, many things, you might need to go through a middle person that you would not need to do the same thing as in developed market. And let me give you a few examples here. Just now I mentioned, even if you want to do a, a swap COVID test, you also need to go for a middle person. And that's very true, especially for brands, FMCG, when they need to apply for halal certifications, they should go with a local agent instead of spending their own time, their own effort. And if they do it by themselves, it, it usually takes more than six months. But if they do it by an agent who knows the process and the government departments, it could really, really save your time. And then, for example, if you want to set up your own payment gateway, it isn't as easy as setting up PayPal or Stripe. Um, you better go for an agent. Reg registering a brand trademark in Indonesia, which is highly relevant to most of you who are in consumer products. And if you want to have your local legal documents translated into the local language, you have to go to the specific um, solicitors and lawyers appointed by that particular organization. So these are very, very common. And a lot of times I've seen my clients, they might underestimate these best amount of work because it also involves number one, where to find these middle person, how to assess them, how to compare the charges. So it's very easy to miss out some of the costs and it ends up the market entry budget um, increase dramatically because some of the some of these were not calculated at the beginning and i think it's very important to set the expectation not to expect there's a one-stop solution that could cover everything i have seen one-stop solution that could advise you consult for you about all these resources and integrate them into one package for you but basically there's no one company that could cover all these and do these by themselves. So um, I mentioned the tax system of Indonesia is one of the most complex in Asia. Here is a, it gives you a general picture of what exactly it is. There is VAT, there is a corporate tax, and there's import tariff. I'm not going to into the details of these, but um, keep this as your fact sheet. The next thing is, um, I, I love this title when I wrote it, same, same, but different, because it's a very Asian uh, version of English. And even though we talk about middle class and everyone knows, of course, middle class, they like social media, they like TikTok, they shop because the KOL talks about it. Yes, the tactics, the tools are the same, but the mentality and the behavior of the particular segments are very different. So overall, Indonesians, they are very, they like something entertaining. They don't like pressure. They don't like information they don't they don't like being overloaded a lot of information so when we uh, do the when we plan the marketing campaign the content needs to be highly entertaining it needs to be fun humorous very on trend and there is, needs to be factors to help the consumers to look good and feel good which is about showing social status um Indonesian consumers are still very price sensitive, but eventually price isn't what drives the conversion. It is more about the psychology and about the convenience to their particular lifestyle. Marketing messages and choice of KOL need to be better segmented and targeted. And from my experience, um, the, the allocation to KOL marketing in Indonesia is usually bigger than other markets. In mature market like Hong Kong, we would spend more on creating the content on Facebook, for example, or doing a lot of ads. In Indonesia, we would spend more on KOL. And the other day I was just sharing this with one of my friends who is in digital marketing. He said when he posts the same post content on Facebook Hong Kong, people are so stingy in clicking like, 
well, lucky we might get maybe just 200 light. But in Indonesia, even without boosting the polls, it's so easy to get 500, 600, 800 light. So this exactly explains the difference in culture is that people in uh, Indonesian, they are a bit more casual. They like something fun. They are not stingy in giving light. They will share news. So this is all always in their culture not just on social media but also on their offline behaviors and that's why how to drive their word of mouth is particularly important and that's why it ties on to the kol collaboration as well um so i've already covered a bit about the different segments of middle class and so give you let me give you an, an uh, example a middle class person who resides in jakarta would prefer very different brand than a middle class who lives in Bali. First of all, because of the difference in income. Second, because of the brands that they see locally. Not every brand, of course, in Jakarta, you see all brands, all types of, all formats of businesses, but that doesn't quite happen in tier two, tier three cities. So people who live in Bali, for example, they don't see the same offline stores as people who live in the capital. And this unconsciously influence their behavior and their brand preferences. So when we do marketing for Indonesia, we also need to segment by city. That is super important. On the other hand, maybe people from Hong Kong, we don't feel the familiarity with Indonesia except the domestic helpers, um, but that isn't a very full explanation or a full picture of what Indonesian customers are about. On the other side, um, uh, alternatively, or let's put it that way, Indonesians, they love Hong Kong. Hong Kong is actually one of their top travel destinations for first time travelers. Um, usually the, the first destination would be Singapore and then Malaysia and then number three would be Hong Kong. So optimizing utilizing the hong kong brand design in hong kong still has a lot of attraction and uh, in terms of in terms of branding to indonesian customers and in general indonesians believe that hong kong is very international the brands there are have very nice packaging look very global higher quality and we need to maximize these uh, mindset factors in our branding and local marketing and um, I also got asked these questions for such a huge population. Do I need to increase my marketing budget dramatically? The answer is no, because the mar marketing cost in Indonesia is so much lower than Hong Kong. In general, it's just about 25% or 50% of developed market. And let me give you an uh, another example. So recently I've done a campaign for a Hong Kong food brand. And they want to have a theme song, which is in, in uh, Indonesia, Bahasa Indonesia. So we hire a producer from Indonesia to write the song, to write the lyrics, and we got a vocalist to sing that song. So this whole production, including renting the studio and everything, how much do you think it would cost in Hong Kong? I think it's a very hard guess because I don't know how much that would cost neither. But in Indonesia, for this particular project, we only spent four thousand five hundred Hong Kong dollars on such production. So I think this is a very good example for for brands, for marketers. Don't worry about you will have a shocking number of marketing budget. It's not the case. You will. What will happen is that you will use less money but be careful with the allocation of different buckets. Put more money on KOL. That would be the uh, rule of thumb for marketing in Indonesia. Well, and um, when planning the annual marketing calendar, Indonesia is very unique because there are all kinds of religions there. Uh, majority is Muslim. They also have Christianity, Catholic, Catholic and, and Buddhism and then in Bali you've got Hinduism and all these festivals would be on your calendar and so basically every month you would need to have some promotions going on that's number one number two sometimes all these festivals promotion festivals created by e-commerce player 
will also take place on an offline level. And so, for example, during the um, Tokopedia anniversary, a lot of shopping malls will also have bazaar pop-ups and promotions during this time because the online and offline are fighting for business. So when we do the marketing, we need to look at all these. And here I give you a, this is just a very rough calendar. And here you see, of course, Ramadan might be something new to Hong Kong marketers. And you see Lazada's birthday, Tokopedia's birthday, Bukalapa has their birthday, Shopee JD, everybody got their birthday. So every month there is a promotion. Mother's Day in Indonesia is different than Mother's Day in Hong Kong, which falls in May. So all these factors becomes a very, very busy and packed marketing calendar. So the next question is, oh my God, do I need to do all of these? Um, well, the answer is no. You need to know all of these, but you don't have to join each of them uh, because of cost concern and because not all of them are relevant to your brand. And um, and for the Muslim Labaran, which might be something new to, to audience from Hong Kong, it is the best time for fashion, consumer electronics, and beauty. So this is something new for us. And um, in terms of live streaming, of course, all ASEAN countries are seeing this trend as well. But what is so special in Indonesia is that they, the, the brands there don't just do live streaming on Facebook or IG or TikTok. They also have their local live streaming platforms. And here I put a link um, where you can see all the top live streaming TV um, channels that a lot of local brands would leverage to do marketing for themselves. What they're really strong as, for example, Shopee works together with a K-pop agency in Korea. So when people join, when people watch the Shopee's live streaming on one of these TV channels, they could at the same time watch the concerts and K-pop star interviews on these um, live streaming shows. So this is a very 360 degree integration of entertainment, fun, something humorous, something cash to relaxing together with shopping on the social platform. This is really exciting and interesting for Indonesia. Okay, here comes the, the part that we've been waiting for is that we want free resources. Tell me more. Um, it's great news for Hong Kongers. But I'm not, I'm not sure how about other countries, maybe Taiwan and Malaysia would also have these schemes from government. So this is for Hong Kong companies only. There are plot fund you might have heard of, there's EMF and there's TPB that helps Hong Kong companies register in Hong Kong to enter 10 ASEAN markets for your local marketing, which includes hiring KOL, Facebook ad or social media management, you run a live streaming or you open a store. You need to set up your store, you hire people locally, you need to make prototype or you need to buy machinery and, and build your factory. All of these are covered by the buff fund and there's a total of 4 million per company matching the budget that you will spend in um in these countries and the emf uh, that used to be really really strong helping hong kong companies to to participate in trade fairs and market tours market visit and um and some of the online ads as well tvp is for you to enhance your website for example, one of my clients, Aniso, the one that I'm going to talk about, they add a, a, a Bahasa version in their current website and uh, upgrade some of the payment system to make it more Indonesia friendly. That is something eligible to the government funding. All right, so now I'm going to tell you a very tactical case, strategic case uh, of how a Hong Kong based startup, which just started two years ago, less than two years ago, how they enter Indonesian market from zero within four months time. I'm sure most of you haven't heard about this, uh, which is 
uh, which is normal because Anisa, when it started two years ago, they basically started on Kick, uh, Kickstarter and they raised a pretty good amount of funding and then they started making watches. The founders, one of them come from uh, a traditional OEM watch background and the other one is a designer. So it's a, a dream project for these two gentlemen. They want to do something exciting and, and create a Hong Kong watch brand. Um, they started with a very presentable website and they've done their social media pages and they have done some really good creative assets, tokenized photos. And then they started looking at different markets. Why do they want to expand to Indonesia? First of all, because they feel like, okay, there are so many competition in Hong Kong. How could they stand out and differentiate? It's always the challenge. Um, number two, because of the pandemic and trade war and everything, they have to look at a new market, a new territory for longer term of growth. And of course, the, the, the middle class growth in Indonesia becomes the, the biggest attraction to them. Each piece of this watch costs 2,100 Hong Kong dollars. And for more than a year time, they were in the stage of soft launch. And then until a point, they felt like we have to be more ambitious. We need to go after, um, we need to plan for the next five years. And so Indonesia came to the picture because of the about factors. And so when I help them with this launch, the first question is, okay, when is the best time to launch? Should we launch for the Chinese New Year? Is that the best time for people to buy watch? Or should we launch before Christmas? Or should we look at the Labaran? So that's when the time we look at the whole marketing calendar and we have to make a decision, which is the best time to launch this. Of course, certain type of products do not need to look at uh, from this, this perspective, for example, if you're selling food, you could launch it any time. But for fashion item, there is still a seasonal factor for people to style themselves or for them to buy gifts uh, for, for themselves or for the friends. So when we look at the calendar, we started this process roughly in July this year, which means Currently, this project is still going on. I'm actually inviting all of you to witness the development of Aniso. This project is still going on and it will be launched in the market next year in November. So we decide to launch in Q4 because there are many things going on, not just the Christmas, but also all these e-commerce promotions will happen starting from the beginning of November. So this is the golden period we have to catch. Otherwise, we'll need to wait until next year, which will be um, the, the, the first promotion season will be Chinese New Year, but it's relatively small in Indonesia in terms of um, uh, fashion shopping and consumer goods. And that means we might need to wait until May for the Labaran. So it's too long time. Owners cannot wait. They want to get sales right away. So we thought, OK, let's try to make this happen within four maximum five months. So Christmas, we nail down this target. Number two, we, we, we want to know which is the best strategy for entry. Should we go, should we, should we list on these e-commerce because they have high traffic, they have all these promotions. Of course, it seems to make sense to get listed on Shopee, JD, and etc. But then we also thought about how should we plan all these um, local fulfillment, the promotion fee that we need to pay to these platforms and who is going to manage the content and, and, uh, and creating extra videos for that, managing the customer service. Can my client and Niso accommodate that as a startup? And don't forget that they are only established for less than two years. It's not like they have a team of 20 person. So does this make commercial sense? Plus minusing all the costs that we need to pay to these e-commerce. So during the process of all these financial projections and calculations, we vote out this option. And then we need to think, um, how do we marry the short-term pandemic strategy with long-term growth objective, which means, okay, shall we start small right now? Let's try to test the market, find out the targets, and get some sales, get some cash back, 
and then we reinvest that for the long-term growth, which seems to uh, make more commercial sense for a startup. And then we also think about how do we leverage the international resources to speed up the market entry. And here we mean like the um, the some of the photos were taken overseas by renowned KOL. And how does this part of the image facilitate the growth and building the brand for Indonesia market and also the government funding from Hong Kong part. So these are the international resources we could use and um, yeah, get the government funding for the growth. So in the end, the strategy we decide is that we don't need to go big, but we can make big sales by enhancing the current website, which means first of all, build a Bahasa version for the website. We need to change the content, the copywriting, content direction, structure of the website to make it look more Indonesian friendly. Something that the middle class of Indonesia would be so familiar with. We put the um, Indonesian payment gateway in place in the website. And we also need to do a lot of local digital marketing. Um, which includes the SEO and then Facebook marketing and identify the right KOL. And again, these, these tactics are not something new, but what is so important for this brand that has no experience in Indonesia, and even if we say, okay, middle class are your targets, 2,100 Hong Kong dollars is a lot for the majority of Indonesian consumers. The first thing we do for SEO is that we need to find out which type of the middle class would be their targets. So we have to spend about two to three weeks time um, of a trial SEO period just to narrow down the right targets before we select which KOL to employ. And a lot of times, or sometimes, some brands, they would start with the KOL part because it's so exciting. Let's do some casting. Let's look at their IG profile. And once we find the KOL, then we'll know what to do. No, not quite the case for Aniso. We have to identify the right segment before we connect it with the right KOL. So that's the overview of the strategy. And how do we put that into a four months time frame? we have to speed up the, the, the part one. So at the beginning, of course, we need to spend some time to understand the, the business objectives, the vision of the founders and their capabilities of expansion, expansion which involves their cash flow, their um, internal team resources. Do they have people to create so much content um, in the local version? And then we need to do a quick study on the market price points, sales channels, and the, uh, the, the products available in Indonesia right now. So the price point 2100 that I just mentioned is actually um, a uh, after price adjustment. What they used to sell is a lot lower than this. And then we add the 25% rule that I mentioned um, before, plus the other marketing costs, which becomes 2,100. So this already took some uh, calculations and a lot of strategies because we have to understand what exactly are the, the tax and logistics costs involved. And then we formulate the strategy as what I just said, should we go purely on e-commerce, our own platform, or we look for a, a retail distributor and et cetera. So we explore all these options. And then we need to negotiate with uh, e-commerce enablers and other tax pa uh, partners, uh, registering, trademark, logistics, sending products. All these operation setup needs to be in place even before we know what to do with the marketing. Simultaneously, uh, we work together on a marketing calendar on how to tackle the right segment and identify them. Um, uh, of course, this whole plan are also split into different phases. There's a trial phase, there's a targeting phase, and there's a purely conversion phase that we just need to convert um, all these targets into making sales. And then we'll fully implement it next month, which is uh, around the clock, it's going to happen. 
after the first three months, we will come back and revisit the whole plan and see what needs to be adjusted, not just in terms of the marketing plan, but also the whole operations and whether the client's internal team are able to, to manage the whole process and what needs to be trained and what other resources they would need to hire. And uh, one of the things that client always they're always concerned is that okay it involves a language that i don't understand what am i going to do after these three months when the consultants are gone how are they going to run it by themselves and that's exactly what uh the consultant will need to work together with the brands help them to learn how to run the business and to build local resources based in indonesia that will that understand the brand and they have the capability to execute long term for the client. So a few key learnings and then I've covered some of them already. Um, just my my advice for Eniso, and it might not be the same case for all brands, is that don't dwell on launching full scale right away. Um, adopt a combination of market entry strategy instead of one it's possible to launch and adopt different strategies during different phases and each phase might last for at least three months, six months, and sometimes even one year. Local fulfillment for e-commerce is important. However, some categories are privileged. Customers can wait. Watch is one of the cases. If the sellers if, if we sell food, if we buy a, a pack of snacks online, of course, we don't want to wait for two weeks. But if we buy an expensive watch or something that is that is fashion related, customers actually don't mind to wait. And so there is no, uh, there's less urgency for brands to feel like I have to do local fulfillment. I need to prove I need to put my products there. I need to set up a company in Indonesia first. No, that's not always the case. You you need to know the behavior of your specific category so that you could match the strategy with that. What takes the longest period of time will surprise you. So when we look at this timeline, guess what takes the longest? And India, okay, these are reference period in the end is not quite the same. What took the longest is um, I thought it would be identifying the strategies or talking to different partners. In the end, it was actually to, to set up the payment gateway because the procedures were so complex, it requires a lot of documents. We need to talk to different agencies. Um, we need to collate those documents to begin with, with the clients together. So that process alone took more than one month when we thought usually if we do the same thing in Hong Kong, it, it could happen within a week, right? So I think all these surprises, even uh, after, after managing for so many brands in Indonesia, these still happens, but we sort of get an idea of what surprises might come up. Clearly segment your customers and build database through SEO and SEM before spending huge amount of other types of digital or social marketing, which I, I've um, covered already. So I think it's very exciting for Eniso, um, all of you, if you could help to look out next month is going to launch. So that's all of what I would love to share with you today. Um, I hope you learn a bit more about Indonesia and if there's anything more you would like to know or just to get a sense check of whether my brands, my products are good for ASEAN, contact me anytime. Thank you. Thank you, April. That was a very insightful topic. And yeah, coming from Malaysia, I can see that ASEAN is definitely growing. And I hope to see and hear more about ASEAN in the future. Um, yeah, let's move on to the next session, which is the Q&A one. Um, as some of you who might just join us a little bit later, uh, let me explain how it goes again. So you can ask the question in the Q&A chat box and also vote for the question that you want April to answer as a priority. Um, yeah, so as while you're typing for the question, um, April, I'm just gonna ask you one question. Uh, what do you think about Indonesia in the next five years? Are there any trends that will emerge? Mm, um, 
the trends, I think number one is the uh, middle class is going to grow even further. And because of that, and I've seen a lot of young talents, um, particularly those who work in the digital side, uh, you might have heard of Go, Gojack or Grab and all these e-commerce players, they have entered Indonesia for almost 10 years. Some of them have been there for 10 years. So these 10 years of trainings trained a group of young talents within Indonesia that are so capable in every single department of the digital business. So I would think a lot of international companies, they might consider or they will set up their regional Southeast Asia hub in Indonesia. Uh, in the past, they of course, they prefer Singapore, but as the cause, if, if they compare the cause and um, uh, Indonesia is now a, might be a better choice as a Southeast Asia hub, I think this is going to happen even a lot more than before. Okay, uh, we got one question from Chan. What's the rough uh, reasonable budget to launch a product in Indonesia market and what's the split? Does it vary a, a lot among different industry? Ah, okay, yes. Well, it varies um, among different industries and I think also it depends on the stage of development. But just to give you a, uh, an idea, the cost structures would involve um, Usually there's a, a, a bucket for market research and then there's a bucket for lining up the local partners, maybe as the distributors, maybe as a, a JV partner, maybe it's the e-commerce, there are fees involved. So that's the second bucket. The third bucket would be the tax, and, uh, uh, all the regulations, getting the paperwork, certifications, import tariff. And then another bucket is the local marketing, which would be your biggest bucket. Um, for a standard consumer products, I would say it requires at least 450,000 Hong Kong dollars or up to start with. And this would help you to enter the market and do some sales for the first six months um, this is the number I've seen, but of course, it, it really depends on the scale of your company number of products that you launch, how many CDs are you looking at. But if you really want a benchmark, I would say, yeah, at least 450,000 Hong Kong dollars would make sense. Um, okay. Second question, how can foreigners network local Indonesian who are interested in e-commerce or developing business in an online way during COVID. Are there any avenues? Okay, sorry, let me check. Can you... Um, I'm looking the question. Um, the question is from uh, Karen Lang. How can foreigners network local Indonesian who are interested in e-commerce or developing business in an online way during COVID? Are there any avenues? Mm. How, do, how do foreigners network with local Indonesians? Um, I think, well, number one, you, you need to know someone there. Um, same as many emerging markets, everything is about knowing the the network so maybe start asking around your friend in the business world can someone introduce someone and introduce someone so that's number one number two there are also consultancies um in the market N not just my company to be fair um that might help you to line up the very specific resources that you need and number three i would suggest you have to meet these people face to face in order to assess their credibility and uh, the the solid resources that they all is quite different than people in in hong kong for example i i've heard companies say hire freelancers purely from online platform but in indonesia please don't do that uh, most of the cases it could be very risky when it comes to payment and the quality of work. So uh, meeting face-to-face -face is the key. And um, we could only do that after the pandemic. Okay. Uh, following question by Sonia Wong. What are, the, what are some of the potential issues that business owners should take into consideration when expanding into ASEAN? Can you repeat again? 
what are some of the potential issues that business owners should take into consideration when expanding into ASEAN? Okay, well, there, there could be a lot of issues. Um, some of them were covered in, in the five mistakes that I mentioned before. And then the other thing that I would like to highlight is the tax, sorry, uh, the policies and regulations keep changing in Indonesia based on who is in charge of the government. And it's not just the president, it's all about the, the mayor of the city or the head of specific departments. Uh, a, 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 a one of the brutal truths is that these type of regulations could change not just every year, but maybe every few months, things are very different. And the information is not so transparent online. So this is always the challenge that uh, it's so hard to know which is the final version. And even though you know the final version right now, things would change in two months. So the company owners always spend a lot of time in just to understanding what are the, the framework that they could get through. I think these challenges are not something that we could completely solve, but we need to find a way to navigate that. And that's why you need to work with expert and go to the, the, the right website to look for these information. You might see uh, many different pages on Facebook where expats and foreigners, they share their experience of, uh, of all these. But most of the time, even those people, they don't have the final answers so that that actually would confuse you. So just go to the official website and um, find a person who can go there locally to the government office or, or give a call and talk to the person who actually executed. I think that's the best way to avoid going through uh, uh, wasting your time. Okay, this question has quite a number of four. Uh, jo, it's by Jo Leong. How is the general situation of penetration rate in digital payment and the users' behavior of credit card users across middle classes? Ah, okay. That's a good question. Um, in general, the credit card ownership in Indonesia is lower than 20%. It's really, really small. And the penetration of owning a bank account is even smaller. Um, and then in terms of using um, digital payment, uh, I don't have the figure right now, but I, the, the very interesting thing about Indonesia is that if you go to any e-commerce website, for example, Tokopedia, you will see there are more than 20 payment options. Um, and people there like to pay installment for anything. So they could pay with credit card, they could pay at a convenience store, they could use e-wallet, they could pay installment, and they could do cash on delivery. So the, the payment options in Indonesia are so fragmented, which looks very convenient to customers, uh, in the first place, but then to sellers, to business owners, you will need to spend a lot of effort and time to manage the income and cash from each of these channels and each of them charge you different transaction fees. So that would increase your, your admin time. Um, I think that is a, a very big challenge for in terms of payment in Indonesia. Riley Lee is asking, what's the notable differences between East Asia and Southeast Asia? in terms of business? East Asia, where, um, can you be more specific which country would you mean by East Asia? Do you mean China, Taiwan, or um, can you specify that? Riley, you can say it in the chat box or in the Q&A and then I'll just convert the message. Or we can, uh, while waiting for Riley to say, well, maybe we could go with the next question first. Okay. How do I get KOL in Indonesia by law masters? Uh, how do you get KOL? Mm -hmm. I would say in uh, in general, the, the recruitment of KOL isn't very different than other countries. A lot of brands would just go through IG and Facebook and see who has the biggest number of likes. That's the step one. And then second, you really need to know their their um, conversion, their sales record, whether they have 
work with brands, all these credibility check is also a key. Uh, second thing is that in Indonesia, so far there hasn't been anything like in China, there's there's a company called Part Lu or other um, KOL incubators where they consolidate all these information and they act like an agency. In Indonesia, there hasn't been something quite like that that is established. So I would say your, your own effort um, or involve a local marketer's effort would be would still be the key. You need to judge from the uh, social media, from the campaigns that are going on around yourself. And this could change very drastically depending on the trend. Uh, as I said, KOL marketing is a big piece in your in your marketing bucket. And um, all these people, they might be trendy at the beginning of the year, but then a few months later, they are no more. So your, your KOL effort needs to keep changing and be very, very flexible. Uh, back to Riley's question, Riley said, Riley was referring to uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong in terms of East Asia. Sorry, China and Taiwan. So again, I think China and Taiwan are very matured uh, in terms of the business ecosystem and the consumer behaviors is actually harder to influence these people. If you think about it, like the example of uh, the number of likes you could get in mature market versus Indonesia, I think this is the the biggest uh, the, the the biggest challenge for mature market. Very hard to influence them in Indonesia. It's quite easy to influence them because word of mouth. And, and, and the mom and pop, the neighborhood connections. And in small cities, there are a lot of communities, uh, committee, the village committee. And we need to understand the structure of these communities that uh, the, the, the local village leader might be your KOL as well. I think this is the biggest um, difference. For example, I, I was based in Bali for five years. And in Bali, they call the village banja, and each banja has a committee. There's a leader, there's a team of people that they would go around the village and talk to the owners of different houses from time to time. And they have regular activities like cleaning the village together. So this is a very specific context for Indonesia that uh, these mini, mini group, micro groups can be your influences as well. Uh, we have a question from Megan. What should overseas brand do during these trying times? So during this what? Trying times. Trying time. What should overseas brand do during this trying time? I think um, brands should maximize their time to do research. Um, particularly because we can't travel. So there, there's no way we could see the market or feel the product or observe the customers. The, the best thing to do now is just to read a lot of data and reports online. Get yourself familiar with what exactly this market is happening. So the research is always critical before entering Indonesia. I have seen some brands that they um, that they enter without doing a comprehensive research and that ends up they really miss out opportunities. Um, so I think let's not waste this time and particularly a lot of countries, not just Hong Kong, they are looking at ASEAN right now. If you only start planning your ASEAN strategy after the whole world gets back to normal, that would be too late. There will be too much um, competitions going on and it's hard to negotiate a better deal. And some of my clients that are in retail, they have already started talking to distributors in Indonesia because this is the time when they could squeeze the, the margin. Honestly, this is the best time for you to get good deals. Uh, this next question is by Harry Tan. What's the tips to optimize online to offline marketing overseas? I like that you guys have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and all these are very practical questions. These are exactly what uh, brand owners or marketers would face um, when they enter Indonesia. What is the best O2O strategy? Mm, I would say you 
any brand, any category have to have both presence. Um, let's not worry about how extensive the presence is to begin with. Just get into the market to be seen first. Let people talk about that. So like the Jakarta notebook case that I, I mentioned, just get into it. Any opportunity is good. And uh, sometimes it might surprise you. Uh, I have got this client that sells uh, um, ladies clothing and she thought her sales would do better in a first tier cities, big shopping mall versus a a um a very very traditional mall in a second tier city but in the end the results is the other way around so i think um we do the research but let's not have too much assumption on how things will, will turn out and be expected that uh retail might perform better than online you need that factor to drive the awareness to drive the word of mouth for your online business. And uh, realistically, consumers in Indonesia, even that they see you joining the promotion on the e-commerce platforms, they will still try to look for where, whether there is an offline store near home so that they could go see it and feel it and ask around. I think this behavior is, is always there. So you have to get offline presence no matter what. Okay, are there any more questions? Okay, hey, so if there are uh, no further question, I guess that's pretty much it for today. Uh, thank you, April, for sharing and everyone for joining us. I hope that you enjoy our session and hope that you gain some insightful information. Uh, right now, I'm going to send everyone a link leading to our survey form for you to rate your experience with us today. We would love to hear your feedback as well as let us know what topic you would like to hear in the future. If you would like to connect with April, please follow her on LinkedIn and with me on Facebook at Growth Marketer Academy. Okay, I'll just pop the link right now. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, you'll be able to view today's recording and slides an hour from now at, or at any other day just by clicking the same link that you enter with the webinar. Uh, catch us on the next webinar series on the 3rd November at 8 p.m. Hong Kong time, same as today, on how to jumpstart an e-commerce business and how to boost sales with proven marketing strategy by Katie Choi, a senior e-commerce manager at Dyson. To get to know more about the webinar, you'll be redirected at the registration page at the end of the session. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, April, once again, and everyone for tuning in. And I hope to see you, the audience, in the next webinar session. As the Indonesian says, Selamat malam, stay safe, and goodbye.